So Benedict will be um, presenting distributed routing and permissionless flat networks. Um, so 10 minutes, yep. Yeah, well, it's a lightning talk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hello. Um, I'm here to talk about distributed secure routing in permissionless flat networks. Words, what do they mean? Uh, we need to start somewhere. Does anyone know any of these logos? <laughs> Hands? Okay, great. Um, so we're not talking about any of these. <laughs> most of these are run on IP most of the time. Um, so what is IP? IP is uh, assignment of addresses and uh, moving data packets around a IP network. And all this layer two, three, four stuff runs on top of hardware. So we're also not talking about Raspberry Pis, phones, uh, Bluetooth, uh, uh, Wi-Fi radios. We're talking about this middle layer, IP, address assignment, and routing packets around this network. <coughs> it's useful to start somewhere. Uh, is anyone familiar, or, or they would say that they're um, comfortable with configuring the home router? Hands? OK. Um, comfortable. Cons uh, Announcing BGP routes, autonomous systems. We're in a networking conference, no? <laughs> um, so the way the way that the internet works is, you can imagine you're one of these uh, nodes inside one of these domains, uh, the circles. Uh, you you basically pass packets to your uh, to your ISP, and then they are they they take care of the interdomain routing through BGP, and they would talk across these regions. So uh, regular users do not really um, have a way to understand this world and participate. Um, so this might be a problem. Um, I'm going to read a quote from Axelia, a, the author of Eggdrasil, and try to frame this problem. For a large network to scale, it must be subnetted into smaller, more easily manageable networks, which then must be, in turn, networked together to form a network of networks for internetwork connections, the internet. This requires some level of expertise and planning to do. And this sort of structure tends to favor hierarchies wherein small networks are largely at the mercy of a large network. For example, the only connection to your homeland has to be another network, uh, has to another network is your connection to an ISP. And peering or directly connecting to your neighbor's LAN is virtually unheard of. You don't just like plug an internet cable into your neighbor. You go through your ISP to get to your neighbor. So let's talk about this other way of thinking about packet routing um, in these terms. So I, I want to emphasize these words. Uh, what do they mean? Distributed means every node is capable of doing compact routing. We're going to define compact routing later. Secure, it means in a network that's uh, flat like this, you want to have end-to-end -end encryption and some sort of ability to route around malicious nodes. Permissionless means IP addresses can be self-assigned. You don't have to ask for permission in order to participate in this network. Hello, hello, uh, Mike. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. One minute. <laughs> are, are you okay, Brian? Is your network still on? No. Okay. Right. <laughs> can, can we can we use your solar panel system? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a good ice cream, right? <laughs> yeah. 
Any questions so far <laughs> about what I said? Okay. What, what was the reminder you said that we're breaking down now? Ah, that I, I was going to show up. Distributed secure routing in permissionless flat networks. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. How much of this is a function of, like, you said you can't plug into your neighbor's LAN? How much of that is a function of the routing protocol? And how much of that is a function of you don't own the cable name that's meeting? It, no. It's definitely both. It's uh, also for uh, like, a, like a knowledge gap problem. Um, is it supposed to be open? Okay. I'm wondering if I should re-plug this. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, so that's the line, and I think we're talking about secure routing with end-to-end -end encryption between nodes, and uh, some sort of ability to route around malicious nodes. Permissionless means uh, I don't have to ask for a central authority to assign me an IP address, uh, and when we are able to do this, we can just spin up nodes, and they would mesh kind of autonomously. Uh, flat. Network means IP addresses are not subnetted. There's no planning to the network. People just generate random IP addresses, and it, it, we can still get uh, uh, somewhat efficient routing. So uh, now I want to define uh, compact routing. How does it differ from the picture we saw uh, with BGP interdomain routing? Uh, it emphasizes keeping small amounts of routing state in each router. So it kind of flattens the network without piling all the work onto these core routers of the internet that are run by ISPs. Uh, without a full network view, though, we cannot run the usual shortest path algorithms to help us uh, route packets efficiently. So there's some trade-off. We, we want each node to have, uh, ha have sublinear growth of the routing table, but also get to uh, kind of shortest path routing. And it would be nice if we can bound, we can have an upper bound of like how much worse a path would be compared to the shortest path. Uh, and name independent routing schemes mean uh, there's no planning or pre-processing of, of IP addresses. Uh, we can assign random names uh, to, to these nodes and it becomes a, a network that doesn't need some central management. Uh, today I'll talk about two specific protocols. One is called CJDNS. Uh, it co auto configures an overlay network. Uh, so underlying you still have a, a physical connection which can be a cable or it can be uh, some sort of ad hoc uh, wireless thing. Or you can tunnel that over the internet. It uses uh, elliptic curve cryptography for uh, all the traffic end to end. Uh, it self assigns an IP address through the cryptographic keys, and uh, it, it uses a distributed hash table for routing. Self assignment of IP, IP addresses, how does it work? It performs two rounds of SHA on the public key to derive an address for you. Uh, we're not too worried about collisions because the chance is very small. Um, so through that, we, we, we can see how end-to-end -end encryption can be achievable because when you send a packet to another IP address, you know that they, they are the only person with the private key to decrypt that. Uh, and IP address self-assignment, forming an autonomous network, and the IPs are definitely random because they, they are just hashed from uh, public keys. Uh, Kademlia, how does it work? Anyone heard of uh, distributed hash tables and know how they work? Okay. <clears throat> um, the way it works is like, uh, it's like keeping track of your immediate neighbors. So uh, if I want to come to uh, Spectrum, I wouldn't ask my airline how to get to Spectrum. I would ask them how to get to Berlin, and then I would ask someone in Berlin how to get to Spectrum. Uh, so this real hash table kind of works that way. Uh, so the way that 
routing happens is I have a, so imagine these are like four bit IP addresses. Uh, IPv6 is definitely not four bit. Um, so the node 0011 tries to search for 1110, uh, but it doesn't know where it is. It would instead, uh, it instead know 101. So it's like this black node asking through that path, uh, through that uh, line arrow label one, asking 101, how do I find 1110? 101 doesn't know, but it knows someone closer in address space. So then it would have these iterative queries, and then uh, once, once uh, 0011 finds the path, it would send packets to them, and then it will also store that path in this routing, path, the routing table, so then later on when someone else asks, it can offer that advice. Um, so this sets up something to allow for a uh, for nodes to do compact routing without uh, so, uh, some kind of subnet hierarchy as in the internet. Uh, so let's talk about how to actually get the packet from one place to another. So Rick wants to send a packet to 1110. It would, it would encrypt the packet and then it would slap this header on with these things called directors. It means, um, it means Hey, Morty, send, that, send it down your 0100011 interface. And Morty just goes, oop, I'm going to pop this and append it to the end of the, the return path and then send it down the interface. So, so the next hop is actually uh, Summer. And then sh from her perspective, she sees that there's this next director and she just does the same. And then eventually, uh, the packet will get to the end. So this is called source routing. And it gives the nodes some sort of ability to route around malicious nodes because you, as the source node, you kind of control the path that way. <clears throat> so Hyperborea currently has more than 1,000 nodes in this overlay network. Uh, it has some problems because uh, this IPv6 address space is not, uh, it, it doesn't correspond to physical space. Uh, so your packets may go around like from, from here to Hong Kong and then back to Barcelona and then to Australia and then back here. Um, and it has some other problems. So CGDNS has switched to supernode routing, basically having uh, these supernodes that have a full view of the network, um, and, but traffic is still routed through the mesh. Okay, second, a second uh, network, Yggdrasil, it keeps most of the um, self-addressing scheme, but, all, but changes the way routing is done. Um, ooh, I'm just gonna go through these. Really quickly. Uh, okay. The, <laughs> <laughs> questions after. Um, <laughs> this is the view of a spanning tree um, from the perspective of this node. Um, it has. So this is the coordinate. It wants to get a packet to the to to this node down below. Uh, so if you route through the tree, it would go through this path, which means. One hop and then here, so two hops. Uh, but then it, 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 but then it can also, it's also appear to this node, so that you can just do the greedy path, path instead, which means um, it it doesn't use the DHC in the same way of routing traffic. Okay, I think I'm done. Uh, so these are the two, these are the two things I talked about, and uh, I'm from Toronto Mesh. This is our logo. <laughs> Thank you for the most ambitious lightning talk I've ever seen. <laughs> um, cool, let me look at my list. Um, okay, Adam Burns, are you here? Adam, yes, Adam is up next. He'll be talking about um, his Pocket FM project and, uh, and Sirnet, so please welcome him. Yes. From the little tiny one? Yes. Ah, magic. Yes. Maybe Three, cross fingers? Prepared. No, it should be fine. Just take a minute. Sorry, I thought that was actually mine. It's okay. Not bad. No, no worries. 
Beta Collective, are you guys here? No. <laughs> okay. Well, then let's just wait a minute to see if Adam's computer wants to unlock, and then, um, or I'll, I mean, does anyone else want to give a spontaneous lightning talk? This is the time we have for it, so you're welcome to come up and just talk about your project for a couple minutes. No. Okay. You're okay with that? Yeah. All right. People just have to look at me instead, so I... Okay. Yeah. All right. Hi, my name's Adam Burns. Uh, the two things I wanted to talk about today, uh, primarily one is um, my involvement with a non-profit NGO here in Berlin called MICT, which stands for Media in Cooperation and Transition. And follow on from some of the excellent presentations earlier, MICT uh, is uh, unusual in the sense of being a non-profit NGO who has embarked on, out of need, a open source hardware and software project called Pocket FM. Uh, one unit we've brought in uh, today is in the front room there. It's a black box um, with uh, a FM transmitter uh, and an antenna, and it has various types of input for sound. It also, because of MICT's uh, funding, has a satellite connection to allow for federation of medium-powered FM radio transmitters within areas of conflict, because, as you can imagine, strife-torn areas uh, often present broadcast stations often the, are presented as uh, valid targets. Um, so MICT has deployed uh, the Pocket FM unit, uh, which is an, uh, consists of a little tiny Raspberry Pi that has been um, presented through that, throughout this conference, together with a locally made um, amplifier hardware component and another uh, component that handles uh, user interface, a SIM card for a phone, uh, and uh, as, as I said, also a, a satellite connection as well. Um, so the basic use case for a Pocket FM is for um, refugee camps, as discussed a little earlier. The design criteria was that it be low powered, so it can be powered by solar, battery, or um, mains where, when and where available. Um, and that the content could be federated via a satellite feed if required, but also together with uh, training and education, uh, that local content can also emerge from refugee camps and strife-torn areas as well. And to answer some of the questions earlier, yes, uh, FM radio was chosen because of two reasons. One, the ubiquity of availability of FM receivers, and also, um, robustness, Wi-Fi, um, digital radi radio and other um, media formats often just aren't as robust in terms of a broadcast media as uh, a more ubiquitous um, FM radio, analog FM radio, not the digital type. Um, now, uh, I was going to prepare, uh, show a slide show about um, the deployment of this in these camps. Yep, okay. Um, However, uh, that's the basic functionality of um, Pocket FM. There are some flyers and posters next to the uh, window that describe in further detail some of its capabilities. But what we also started to do was to experiment on expanded capability of this box in terms of these boxes were being um, installed into camps 
um, but we wanted to see how much further we could provide some sort of some amount of infrastructure. Uh, one of the uh, experiments that we did was to find an offline web server that allowed for boards, forums, and communications. Um, so through the USB port of this device, we could establish a second access point, and we discovered some lightweight web server stacks uh, that also supported Arabic and other languages uh, to run on the actual radio transmitter box as well. Um, it works quite well. Uh, the, the next thought and experimentation for this was to try to expand the digital range of this access point via mesh technologies. There is a group in Berlin uh, who have made a, 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 an application called CallNet. Um, a pair of them uh, have uh, enabled a mesh protocol along Android phones and we, would, we did some initial experimentation to try and integrate this into the Pocket FM. However, the problem is uh, ubiquity again. In order for uh, any Android phone to use mesh networks properly, often, uh, at least at the network layer, often you need to root your phone because the default Android <coughs> API provided by Google does not allow this to occur easily in other cases. Um, and the third experiment that we had with Pocket FM is to think about ways of transmitting data over the FM signal. There were three, three ways that we tried to achieve this. Um, one was by a digital part of more modern FM radio called RDS. Often in cars, if you see the little display on a channel with text, um, that is an RDS. It's, you can't hear the signal, but it's picked up and decoded by the radio. Very, very low bandwidth, but it can get messages out to people. Um, the second way was over uh, data over audio in two fashions. One, we experimented with some ultrasonic sound to be overlaid on top of the FM radio signal. Um, however, given the uh, environments these are placed in, this was difficult because uh, to decode it on the other end is quite complex, needing software or other devices. The second was the more interesting and sort of uh, interesting in a sort of retro way. There was another uh, utility we used called Minimodem, and I recommend checking this out, uh, that allows, uh, well, it's basically the protocol that use used to be used in cassette tapes on home computers in the 80s. Now, what this means is we were adapting it for FM radio. So what we envisaged was overnight we can trans transfer data, broadcast data, and uh, rather like these tape, ca compact cassette uh, tapes during the 80s, you could pick up rig a laptop to an FM radio and use it as though it was a modem. If you happen to, to miss the beginning of the download, the download would be repeated and you would pick it up later. So the analogy uh, I sort of liked of that, meaning you, with consumer devices, you could uh, potentially broadcast data, whether it's programs or, or data of any other type over this FM, FM radio. The ultrasonic sonic stuff was very interesting too and it's hit the news over um, advertising networks using these, uh, these protocols to chirp at, uh, between phones and so on. So I just really wanted to present some experimental uh, components of the Pocket FM uh, platform that we've been developing. And secondly, just really quickly in the last minute of my talk, I did want to also present another project uh, with a tentative title of Turn the, the Cloud Upside Down, Precipitating Peer-to-Peer -peer, um, uh, Cloud Infrastructures. This is an ongoing project and it's only just begun, but um, we're building on the work of other people. Uh, again, I don't have the references because of the lack but come see me before I leave this afternoon, um, to install a, a cloud system off, out of the data system, out of the data center, in your home, 
um, on ARM, on a Raspberry Pi embedded computers. The idea of this is to try, like the philosophy of um, Scuttlebutt and so on, to federate your own computing, storage and networking facilities amongst your devices and those devices of these people that you choose to trust, whether they're family. So creating a tree of common resources along a, um, a uh, a resource mesh, so to speak, uh, about uh, uh, along along the lines of human trust rather than any other network topology. The reason for this is not only the politics of this conference are in opposition of large technology companies, but I think it also has to be realised that they are in conjunction a part of a larger industry of not only the content providers and uh, like Google, Facebook, Amazon and so on, but also the data centre industry. We have to decentralise some of this and start to learn about our own communication requirements and bring them closer geographically and uh, human centered in this human centered way uh, to ourselves so we can maintain our own humanity through the uh, against the atomizing um, attempts of large industries to reduce us to pure consumption units of centralized social media. I hope I haven't gone out of time. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I'm on a plane very soon, but uh, if you have any questions, please come up and ask. And if you're interested in this, any of these topics and more, please come see me. Thank you very much. Cool. So we actually do have one more lightning talk before lunch starts. Um, we'll have. Uh, is, is, is this you? Is this you? Or you and Jude? Okay. Yeah. So Chris, Chris, you sent me hi, and uh, Jude Bukadane. Great. So please welcome them. Hi. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. Hi. So um, this is a, another, just to keep our radio theme going, don't, don't stop the beat. Um, uh, this is about Rutio, which is a project that we started about four years ago. Um, uh, my background, uh, I started the MIT Center for Civic Media, and we did a lot of um, platforms for like political uh, connectivity and uh, things like that. Public Lab was a spin-off. Uh, uh, TextMob, which got turned into Twitter, was a spin-off. So I never thought I'd be working in radio, um, but uh, then the earthquake in Haiti happened and um, I had a lot of Haitian friends. I was working with a lot of uh, Haitian friends at MIT. Uh, and uh, I got involved in some digital responses to the earthquake, um, including things like 4636, which was a tech system for reporting, uh, you know, things that would then be channeled to the U.S. Navy and Oxfam and uh, other organizations like that. Um, uh, Ushahidi was being used a lot. There was an effort to uh, build up the um, open street map of Port-au-Prince, even though most of the streets were gone. Um, uh, but uh, in the end, there was a study that was done after this um, uh, that I was interviewed for. Uh, uh, also, people finding was a big thing. Um, uh, and, and they basically studied the community of, you know, a couple thousand tech people who were volunteering and working in that area. And they found that actually local media, the, the thing at the bottom, was absolutely the most useful thing um, in the crisis response. Um, and in particular, FM radio, um, because uh, the, the cell networks were all knocked out. Uh, one radio survived, another was put back up within a couple of days. Um, but uh, by the time the cell networks came back up, everyone's phone batteries were dead. Um, uh, but they did have radios that still had batteries. The batteries on radios last for, you know, potentially days and days and days, weeks. Um, uh, but moreover, the radio was such a flexible medium that, uh, that basically they could take over the programming and there were these intelligent people behind the mic who could respond in real time. Um, and, and it was also the medium that people already knew and trusted. So there were a lot of affordances that made it very um, useful in the, in the response to the, um, the crisis. I was also spending a lot of time in Zimbabwe at the time. and. Um, uh, working with some activists named Kubatana um, who were developing kind of phone based activist stuff. But, um, you know, despite headlines of this, that phone penetration in Africa has hit 80%. 
Um, in fact, uh, that's that's not really true. Um, it's uh, maybe at best 50%. Um, and if you look at the line, it's almost completely flat. So any kind of solution that's assuming Wi-Fi or phones in a lot of the world, places like Haiti or, or most of Sub-Saharan Africa, um, are not really going to be that accessible. Um, uh, but radio is about 96% penetration. Um, uh, so, and, and just this is a, a, a graph that Jude, who's sitting in the back, by the way, um, uh, did uh, around the actual cost by um, uh, Gini coefficient, like the your, your income in a country, uh, for about 20 minutes of phone and like 20 SMSs. Um, so you can see that it quickly gets up to about $500 a month um, in a lot of Africa. So a system that's built in the north isn't necessarily going to scale for incomes in other places. Um, so, uh, and that, that really shows, this was a village that I was at because apparently uh, this is in Uganda, in Western Uganda. Uh, there's a really good radio station there for farmers. And so I was going talking to farmers about what worked and didn't work about the radio station. And these guys said, oh, we don't listen to that station. And um, at first I didn't understand why. And I was like asking, they were like, well, you know, the, the farmers who call the station, they're not really like us. And so I was like, is this a microclimate issue? Because they were seven miles away from the transmitter. I couldn't figure out why they, but they were explaining, yeah, they tend to be cotton farmers. And, and I gradually, as I got to know the situation better, I realized that those farmers, cotton farming is like kind of large scale you have tractors, there's a lot of surplus income. And because the radio is structured in call-in, that's how people participate into the radio shows, um, these guys, none of them had a phone that had both charge and battery. Um, so three of them had phones, two had batteries, but no um, no credit, one had credit but no battery. So, you know, and they had to walk about seven kilometers to get a charge on their phone. Um, so they weren't going to participate. So the only people who participate were like the top 1% of the farmers in that um, area. So we started, um, I met Jude in Uganda. Uh, he's a telecommunications engineer who was working for a local telco. And we started thinking about how to make radio that was more likely to be useful in communities like this one, but also that would connect the community in and out in different kinds of ways. Um, uh, and unfortunately, radio in, in Uganda and a lot of Africa is really run by development organizations. So they actually control almost all the programming because they have money. And so in the end, um, when we would go to people and say, what would you like to have on a radio station? They would say, oh, well, we need a program about hygiene. We need a program about reproductive health. We need a program about... And, and in the end, it, it kind of creates this space where radio is really about development. It's not about um, uh, kind of people's lives in a particular kind of way. So we're trying to say, can we lower the cost of radio where it's um, very cheap? Unlike regular radio, where as it gets bigger, uh, uh, people get smaller in comparison, and your chance of actually being on the radio or having your interests on the radio gets smaller and smaller. Also, a big problem for minority languages. There's about 44 languages in Uganda, of which only about six or seven are served by radio because they tend to go for the lowest common denominator. Um, and so we said, um, let's try to develop a kind of a different approach towards radio where uh, we try to make the radio as small as possible and, and build every aspect of it so that it uh, stays small, so that the economics are small. Um, so basically we start with a really cheap uh, 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 smartphone that's connected to the transmitter through the headphone jack, um, and everything goes over that. And so we can basically make calls from the cloud using kind of like a conference call system uh, to the station phone and push national news, weather, emergency information, things like that that are okay on voice quality. But what's great about this is there's no cost to the station because we're making the outgoing call. And we can buy credits that expire in like 24 hours at about 50 times cheaper than what anyone in the community can afford. So we can subsidize for hours and hours a day, um, just a couple euros, uh, 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 lots and lots of programming that are voice quality programming. And if you have someone like a veterinarian who li lives in a, you know, uh, a trading town, um, they can volunteer to run a program around animal health or something like that and basically people call in if you're if you know NPR like goat talk um, you know my goats making a funny sound you know what's the sound and they can kind of diagnose it over the air and and then it's kind of like free advertising for them um, but then people can also call a number and there's this very common practice across Africa called drop calls um, where if like we're arranging that we're gonna meet somewhere at a particular time but I'm not sure when I'm gonna be done uh, I call you and let it ring twice and you don't answer and so no one gets charged for this but it's a, like a one-bit communication 
So people can call the station, call the veterinarian with their goat problems, but it doesn't answer, so they're not charged. Instead, our system calls them back when the host is ready. And the host is basically doing this all with a feature phone, with just a, a regular non-smartphone through DTMF. Um, so I can give some examples. Um, we have it running back there if you want to take a look at it. Um, it's actually transmitting from that antenna hanging from the ceiling now, um, using Pocket FM as the transmitter, um, incidentally, a beautiful fusion. Um, uh, so um, yeah, Jude, do you want to call? I didn't bring my phone over here. Let me see if I can get this. Do I have, I've got three minutes left. Oh, I've got three minutes left. OK. So then I, I can just show very quickly what's going on with the, um, uh, the station. Um, so um, this is the schedule uh, uh, that's being played right now. Um, uh, so basically, um, uh, it's sort of drag and drop. You um, can look at programs on one side and drag them over. Jude is actually um, transmitting now. Am I transmitting? Yes, you are. Oh, I am. So if you look back at it, radio. it's just a call <laughs> station from his phone. Um, it answered him, and now he's transmitting a program. You are listening to 103.8 FM, Ruscio. Um, uh, we're working on getting the uh, fix the speech and the comments and other uh, so anyway, that's a, that's a quick demonstration. If you want to see a little bit more of how it works, uh, come on back there. <laughs> 